episode 130 of the Parkrun Adventurers. Coming at you from Queensland and Victoria, simultaneously cast around the globe. I am Mel Erbacher. My co-host is Scotty Trickett. Welcome to episode 130, Scotty. Good to be here. Great to be here, Mel. Well, I'm glad that you think it's great to be here. Let's, let's, I noticed something happened on the weekend, Scotty, so I, I want to head straight to that. You've been in my rearview mirror for some time now on the most events list. On the weekend, sneaky, sneaky, you didn't tell me that it was going to happen, but boop, you equaled me on the Australian most events list. What's up with that? Well, I'm just an adventurer, Mel. I'm a parkrun adventurer. I like to get out and sample new events, new courses, meet new people. That's just what I like to do. <laughs> Not and, mentioned uh, to your co-host who you're in a, a bit of a competition with no, that you might no, be no. headed somewhere new. That competition ended at the end of last year when you made a very late dash to pip me on the line. When we were having a competition, but it's taken me nine months to catch you again, and I'm okay. I'm, I'm pretty chuffed that I've caught you. Do you think you're going to stay you there very long? <laughs> do you think I'm going to stay there for very long? Yeah, I do actually. I yeah. do. I think I've got a few more adventures planned over the next few weeks. Not this week, ah. but um, in the future weeks, absolutely, absolutely. But let me okay. tell you about my my park run day, shall I? Please do. So I went out to Wyndham Vale which is a long way from home, and I think it would probably now class as my Nendi. Well, it did class as my Nendi. Formerly was. Yeah, yeah. And how it came about is that, again, we had a free weekend, and my wife, my beautiful wife, her family lives on that side of town. So I'm in the northeast of Melbourne, and Yvonne's family is over an hour away in the west. And luckily, her mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, her mother, lives near Wyndham Vale. And I thought it would be a good excuse to visit the mother-in-law. How good am I? Visit the mother-in-law. <laughs> no and, ulterior motive. No, and get them to come along and join us to her first park run. So I've got to tell you, Mel, it was a little bit exciting. I got to register my mother-in-law and my father-in-law during the week. We did that on Friday because this was all a bit last minute. And I haven't, I haven't registered anybody for five or six years since we started wow. park running. Um, that is exciting. I, it was. It's. It sounds silly. It's just a, a nothing thing to do. But there was uh, there was a sense of joy when I registered a new person. That's and not a nothing thing to do. That's that's the well, start it just, of the. It, it was filling out a form right there. But exactly, it was just it was, the, the act was just filling out a form. But I was hoping and I was hopeful that it's going to lead to so much more uh, for my my family. And so we went out to Wyndham Vale, and I've got to tell you, it was, we had a great time. It, we, when we woke up in the morning, because we had to leave pretty early, it was warm in Melbourne, like where we lived, it was warm. By the time we drove the other side of town, the, the clouds had got black, the wind had started rolling in, and we had this Arctic blast sweeping through Melbourne, and we just happened to time it to the start of the park run there. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter because everybody, it just forced everybody to sort of huddle around and um, there was that real sense of community. Everybody was really happy and friendly and uh, we went out and did the run. It was nice and flat. It was in this open open park area. So Wyndham Vale is one of these up and coming new, new housing estate areas. So there's lots of new homes popping up. But the local council have, has designated this area as an open park area, open space, which is great. One small problem at the moment is that there's no trees there and the trees that they've planted haven't matured. So it's quite exposed is one word. And when there's an Arctic blast coming through Melbourne at the same time, it provided some challenges. But the course itself then winds down to the river and it gets really pretty as you turn around and then you come back up, back up to the uh, start finish area. And they've got a local running group there that's, that's I imagine is born out of the park run called Winfit. They wear great colours, black and green. Not sure if they've pinched them directly from the Western Foldians, but they are identical. Do you have a trademark on those colours for the Western Foldians? Well, we don't have a trademark, but it's a statement. You see those <laughs> colours, you, th- you think of the Western Foldians. 
So, but what I where, where I'm going with this is that obviously the place that you get your apparel from, they they don't give you guys exclusive rights to those colours. No, that'll be in the next negotiations. Uh-huh. We will be trademarking the fluoro. I'm I'm just surprised, as as our mate Matty Trent would probably agree. I'm just surprised anybody else would want to wear these colours. But <laughs> the Winfit crew do. Okay. Running shirts and running clubs notwithstanding, what did the outlaws think of the park run? Like, what was their first experience like? I'm, I'm sure you got the um, the debrief afterwards. I did. I did. And what we did learn is that this was the longest my mother-in-law has ever walked. So she's told us that she goes out for a walk a few times a week, which we didn't drill her on information about those few walks a week. But it turns out they're only 20 minutes. Or I shouldn't say only, but they're about 20, 30 minutes walk around her neighbourhood. Um, so a five kilometre walk works out to be a 60 minute walk. So it was quite a lot longer than anything she'd done before. But I think she enjoyed it, Mel. She said she'd come back. She said maybe not every week. And remember, she's she's a first time park runner. And I don't think she's ready to go by herself. So it would require us to um, tag along and visit every now and then. But I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to do that once a month or so to get my mother-in-law. And hopefully, my father-in-law didn't come along. He stayed in bed. But hopefully okay. next time he'll join in. Well, well done, Mrs. Ivana's mum. Yeah, this is Ivana's mum. And as we've discussed on the podcast before, you and I have both failed in our attempts to get our family, like our mothers specifically, to come along to Parkrun. In fact, I put the question to my mother again this week. I said, how was Parkrun on the weekend? And got... Silence. Stony silence. <laughs> yeah. So I'm moving on to the in-laws and maybe we can convert them to park runners. Oh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to convert anyone who's willing to be converted. I don't discriminate. Every, everyone is welcome to be converted. A massive tick for Wyndham Vale. Like I said, really friendly group of people that I shouldn't be surprised with, but we do compare it to other park runs. It's, it's, it's a... It's just human nature. Every time we go, I've never had a bad time at a park run, but I can't help compare it to other park runs. And I know our friends that are with me now um, had, a, had a little discussion about our top three, how we do a top three. We, we've asked our guests to name their top three, and our old mate Danny doesn't quite agree with it. But I think it's quite... Which is hilarious because he gave us a top three when he was on the show. <laughs> Apparently we forced him into it. Or something to that effect. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to that episode and, and and keep my ear out for the duress that he was obviously under. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, th- I think it's a fun exercise and it's never saying that, that my fourth best park run is an awesome park run and my 60th park run, I still had a great time. But I just think you have some really good experiences and it's got nothing to do with the course so much. Sometimes it's got to do with the people. Other times it's got everything to do with the course. And nothing to do with the people. So again, this is the magic of Parkrun and, and Wyndham Vale. I just had a great time and, and I am looking forward to going back. Well, that's good to hear. It is It is all very, um, you know, personal, isn't it? Like you can have your favourite three books, but they're not going to be somebody else's favourite three books. And they might be your favourites for different reasons as well. But you do tend to find somebody who's got similar tastes to you. And, and you can, you know, inform your own decisions based on what their likes or dislikes are sometimes. So obviously there's never going to be um, a scale that everybody can be measured by equally or anything like that. But it's, I, I think it's nice. I enjoy it. But I think that's the beauty of it, Mel. That's the beauty of it. So when, when we ask people for a, a top three or a favourite, that's not definitive in any way, shape or form. No, that's their top three. It's yeah. nobody else's top three. And it's not. there's no expectation that it will be anybody else's top three. And all we want to do is that if, if you get named in a top three, how good does that make you feel? Like we've never asked anybody for their bottom three. Except for that time we did it on episode 50. I, I didn't get any pushback about that. Did you? About our top three, our bottom three. I mean, yeah, our bottom three. No, I didn't. I didn't have anybody make any complaints or, or write in nasty letters saying they they felt poorly about being outed. No. So that was episode fifty. So that was my math is right, seventy nine episodes ago. So we've we've survived. It was that. yes. Yep. Back in the day, back in the day, Scotty. Well, I'm glad you had a good weekend. I was um back at my home park run thanks for asking and um <laughs> volunteering as it. i Let's do get into it. from time to time 
Sorry? I was getting to it. Oh, you were getting to it. Okay. <laughs> um, however, I am a hotbed of activity coming up in the future, a couple of months with a whole bunch of adventures planned because you know what? I still have eight events to do to get my New Year's goal in for 2018 before the 31st of December. And I am determined not to fall behind. So you're going to want to bring your adventure a game if you want to keep up with me. Just no, it's, saying. It's being brought, bought, brung. It's coming. It's coming. Don't worry about that. I'm not this week, as I said. I'm, ba- I'm back at home this week. Milestone celebrations and the like. But uh, after that, have you, have you gone spreadsheet level? Are you... Mapping it out I'm not yet? quite spreadsheet level. You know, that probably head. would have helped because, I mean, I, I do refer to my diary. However, um, I do have a spreadsheet for the run director roster at Kiwana Park Run and as it turns out, I did not check it before I booked two separate interstate <laughs> adventures for the rest of the year. So, awkwardly, this roster that I created just a couple of months ago for the run directors at Kiwana, I've had to say, hey, guys, um – does anybody want to swap me for my two days in November and December? Because I've accidentally double booked myself and I've got flights and accommodation in other states on those weekends. So I'm having a shocker with my diaries lately. Seriously. It's it's the event event director's problem, isn't it? Just just let them sort it out. At Kiwana? Yeah. (laughs) You're hilarious, Scotty. (laughs) Are you still the event director? I am still the event director. Well, I'm co-event director. Okay. But w- the way we work it is, if somebody on the roster can't do their weekend, then it's their responsibility to find somebody else to replace them. That's a very sensible approach. Um, yeah. And so it was my my dumbassery that got me into this, and <laughs> I'll have to get myself out. But that's fine. I've got a great crew, so it, it'll be all good. So Berlin Marathon was all the rage over the weekend. Some guys were running really fast. Everyone got carried away with world records being broken. But um, we're Aussies. We're very parochial here at the Parkrun Adventurers, and we're only interested in the, how the Australians perform. So we wanted to speak to the Aussie who finished first at the Berlin <laughs> Marathon. So welcome to the Parkrun Adventurers, Julian Spence. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. I was I finished the first Australian, but... I didn't know that until quite late on because um, there was one other Australian running in front of me and I didn't realise that he must have dropped out at some point. So I didn't expect to be in first when I um, when I checked the results later. Okay, so tell us about that. So tell us about all the accolades and all the adulation you've received since finishing first Australian at Berlin. Well, yeah, it's it's been overwhelming, mainly – Due to the community that we've built through our inside running podcast, that's there was a, we had a um, we had Andy Allison who is a friend of the podcast. He well, he basically ran our Facebook page while Brady and I were running, and he's very good at that. And he had a um, live updates, and so we got a, a great amount of engagement over the course of the the morning and. When we we checked later on, there was a lot of well wishes on there, and it was really it was quite over, overwhelming for both Brady and myself um, to go on and read everyone's messages of support and their predictions and and their excitement during the race. And um, it was it is the first. I mean, we've we've been we've been part of the community for a while now, but this was the first time where it really sort of took us by surprise it was so big and um we were really feeling the love so that that's primarily um the like where we we received most of our support or at least i did anyway has that been an important part of the experience for you because obviously berlin marathon is on the other side of the planet there's not necessarily a lot of opportunity for people you know friends and family to go over and support you um so you've got all the support from your online community, obviously as well finishing ahead of the friends that you did travel across with meant that you crossed the finish line by yourself and didn't have anyone there that knew you to welcome you. How did that all pan out? Yeah, it's really funny that you mentioned that because 
it was quite a strange feeling. Um, you, you're an unknown there, obviously. You, there's a lot of people that do support the race on the sideline and you're wearing your bib. But no one really knows you. You don't get the you don't get the familiar faces along the side, um, like you do at the local race. Like say, for instance, Melbourne, you know someone on every corner. Uh, so you you're running out there, and it it is a little lonely. So you think about the people that might be watching. So back home, like we know there's timing mats, and we know that a lot of people will be following the updates. So each time you run across the mat. Your, your thoughts go to the person, people that are watching back home, um, and you you think, oh, I wonder if like I wonder how they're feeling about that split. And so he, he, you're not quite concerned about those that are next to you on the road cheering. It for me, like I was thinking about those cheering back home. Um, but you come down, like for instance, I, you would have seen everyone watched. Um, Elliot Kipchoge finish has been played so often now that you see how wide the the last finishing straight is. It's like probably about a football field wide and it's a very open space. So when I was finishing, the, the hoo-ha of the, the world record's over, it's 15 minutes later, people have calmed down, they've started to think, oh, wait, there was a women's race going on as well and she was coming in maybe 90 seconds behind me. So... At that point in time, there's just a few stragglers rolling through and it, 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 it's like the calm, the eye of the storm, really. So was, you don't get the excitement maybe like if you had friends and family there because the people on the sideline, they're, they're kind of looking past you to see if there's any ladies coming yet. Um, so I finished the volunteers. They, they're not quite like there's been so much excitement. They're still on the come down. So I, no one really claps or cheers. No one gives you a towel, takes photos like Ali and Kip Joge or anything. I kind of just finished the race, stopped my watch, wandered off um, into the tent, and all of a sudden I started thinking, oh, I, I wonder if, like, if anyone's been watching on Facebook. And so I, obviously I knew that they, they were. Um, so I, I checked my phone, see some messages straight away. Like we have our bags right at the finish line in the elite tent. So for us, like we were on our phones really quickly um, to talk to people back home, whereas like everyone else is like celebrating with each other. But because we're there on our own, it's like, oh, we, we need the, we were trying to get that connection back home. So Brady and I were sitting on a bench next to all the other Africans and the whole race coming in, basically just having a little look at seeing what people have written. And when we sat there and we were just like, we were in total shock at the, the amount of support we were seeing. So you mentioned your running mate and your podcast co-host, Brady, there. Yeah, yeah. So he, he, you finished in around 2.16, is that right? Yeah, I was 2.16.39. Yep. So Brady was only a few minutes behind you. So did you immediately wait for him or did you get caught up with the women, winners, finishing? Did you get yeah. to experience it together? Uh, we definitely did. Um, so last year what happened, we both did this race last year together and – I had finished in 2.18.40 and, and I'd turned – basically I'd turned around on the spot. I'd spent a lot of time running with Brady during that race and and I'd, I'd, I'd push forward whereas he struggled a little at the end. And so I knew his goal for like the last five years or something has been to break that magical two-hour 20 mark for him. And so I finished in two hours 40. I, I knew he was close to me and so I turned around on the spot and just waited to see how close he was and – it's such a long straight. You can see like Brady's bright singlet from such a long way away and there's a clock there. And so last year I saw the clock, I saw where he was and I knew that he wouldn't get it. He was so close, but he just missed it. And so there was a certain amount of disappointment um, at the finish line for, for him anyway. Whereas this year I finished two, in the 2.16.39. I, I had no idea where he was because I hadn't seen him all race. So – I said um, congratulations to the person I was running with and then I turned around and thought, oh, shit, Brady's still out there. And I knew like the women were coming in to 18 low. Uh, they finished. So there was a little bit of con like confusion, people running around the finish line. I kind of walked around all that, just stood at the finish and stared back and, and saw Brady's singlet coming down and I saw he had about – 
200 meters to run and I looked at the clock and it was going to be pretty tight and I was just hoping that he got there and in the end he snuck under I think it was eight sec or maybe I think it was about eight seconds that he snuck under by um but yeah he was overwhelmed it's very emotional place the finish line of a marathon in the both the elite section and the the well anywhere from two hours to to six hours a lot of emotion um you can see on people's faces and it like Brady was emotional at the finish. We were both really stoked for each other. Uh, it was it, it's a pretty good vibe. You, you've known Brady for a while. You did the Road to Berlin podcast series with him last year, which I tuned into avidly, uh, listening to the journey that you guys had. Um, it's I know what it's like to watch a friend who you know is aiming for a particular time and you've got that long straight and you just think, oh my God, are they going to make it? And your heart really does go with them. So obviously you must be quite close over all this time. I know also what it's like to finish a marathon, obviously not in the same kind of speed as you. However, I was destroyed at the end of mine. Do you, do you have any of that kind of physical pain still in mind when, you know, you've got that focus immediately of a close friend who is that under the wire with achieving their goal? Yeah, I think I think that there's – a, a quite a shot of adrenaline when you get close to that finish line and that carries you through maybe the first 15 minutes after you cross the line. And so the legs feel okay and, and until you sit down, until you calm down and you assess everything and, and then all of a sudden you can't stand up again. Um, so when I was waiting for Bray, I, was, I wasn't really thinking about my – my soreness so it wasn't too bad this time around um but he was quite sore when he finished he vomited straight away so he was in a worse state than i was he went to a bin and threw up most of his his drinks from the race uh and I, that obviously made me feel pretty like <laughs> i wasn't really too concerned about my sore legs when i saw him in such a state so i uh, yeah Walking back from the race, that's when it starts to really kick in, I think. Like that's when the adrenaline goes down, reality sets in. Hey, all my – like my feet are, are really sore and crushed and um, quads are beat up, my calves sore, my lower back sore, and even my upper back. Like I get a re- – really – I must carry my arms really strangely because I've got – I always get a really sore upper back. Um, and, and, and then – Again, later on, you've you've got that. Mate, I mean, we go out for a few beers, so that kind of takes away the soreness. And then the major reality is the next morning, and that's that's when you know you've run a marathon. That that morning after. Oh, I remember that well. Um, I have another question for you about the actual course because obviously, you know, you run under the iconic Brandenburg Gate, but then, yeah, that finish straight, you still have like 400 metres or so to run. Is that a little bit anticlimactic? Do you wish that you could just finish under that Brandenburg Gate or is just sort of spying that in the distance when, when you get to that point thinking, okay, well, once I get there, then I just have a little bit more to do? Yeah, the, the, the gate signals it for me. Because I know 400 meters is one lap of an athletics track, and that's any anyone can do that pretty much at any time. So 400 meters, um, that's a time to start to savor the moment, enjoy it a little more. Uh, I know once you see, like, you turn onto the road where, that the gate is on one kilometer away, and so you've got 600 meters before you hit the gate, and then another 400, and it's that 600 meters that really takes it out of you because you. You're there, but you're not quite there, and you're trying to push the pace because everyone wants to get that little bit extra off their time. But but one kilometer is a long time to start pushing that. Whereas 400 meters, I know, like one lap around the track, I've done that millions of times in my life. I can get home, um, and and it is a brilliant finish line. So you you get a wave of emotion as you go through the gates, knowing what you've just done. Um, I don't quite get wrapped up in like that, the whole history. Like, I'm probably a little young for that to to appreciate the significance of it all. But for the race perspective, it's definitely like the signal of the end. And so then the, the crowds do line, they cheer. Um, there's a commentator. There's people out like there's people 
let's pump up people on microphones the, the whole way along. Um, and you see the clock. And all of a sudden, once you see the clock, you, you know what your time's going to be. And, and if you've got a benchmark or, like, if you want to break a certain time, then you either got to get on the get on your bike and maybe put in a harder effort whether it's breaking four hours five hours whatever or if you know you're comfortably under then you can enjoy that last finishing straight and um and lap it up julian we're a few days post event now have you started to reflect on your actual performance you're the fastest australian marathoner this year like you you got to be pretty happy with your time or your preparation paid off yeah yeah mate it's um I'm not your typical runner, to be perfectly honest. Like this isn't – for me, I, it's it's September and there are a few big races to come. So I, I won't end up being the fastest Australian for the year. But if you looked at where I was, like I met my partner, Bree, uh, I think about mm, coming up six years ago now and 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 we we travelled in 2013 and I was I – was, a a mediocre runner and up until the last year or so and it's it's never been something that I've considered like being an elite runner I've always just been a runner and I was was obviously quite like good at running but I've never considered myself to be like a national level runner and and so it's it's all coming a little bit quick (laughs) it's it's a bit of a shock really for me to, to to run this time because three years ago I was I was running two two hours and 25 minutes and that's that's nine minutes off what I'm running now and and that doesn't rate in the top probably 30 in, a, in Australia so it's I've, I've taken a, a quantum leap maybe the last 12 months and um it, it's just it is it's not really sinking in yet at some point I'm sure it will but we I think runners ourselves, we're pretty greedy creatures. So once we tick off one goal, all of a sudden the, the next goal just comes up really quickly and, and you move on quite um, oh, not the right word, but it's you probably don't celebrate your achievement a, enough. Like I'm a I might be a little bit different to others because I, I've run two sixteen and, and the immediate thought for me is Oh well, I got to go faster than that. All of a sudden, two sixteen is not my. It's not. It's not good enough. Um, and 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 maybe in twenty years we'll celebrate two sixteen as my best run that I did. But at the moment, I, yeah, I'm I'm feeling like that. I I need to run a bit faster in order to to uh, to to make myself satisfied. I, 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 do you guys feel like that when you run a PB? Look, you're in it's you're in your peak years. form. Yeah, well, look, <laughs> it has been a few years for both of us. But I do get it because you're in peak form. Like you're feeling great. You've just had a great run. But you're probably thinking you can go faster and wouldn't it be cool if you could go faster and you could get higher up those best yeah, year best I, times? I see it on every level. I see the park runners coming in to uh, this, the store in, in Ballarat and we talk about their running and, and they tell me, Oh, I never thought I'd ever break 25 minutes. And then all of a sudden, 25 minutes turns into 23 minutes and then 22 minutes. And and within six months, they're looking back and thinking, oh, what, 25 minutes? How can I consider that a good time? Like, And it's all relative. And it happens like on all different levels. So I, I've got a feeling that is one of the things that keep us running is that we, we're never quite satisfied with, with what we, we have achieved. So have you got have you worked on your next goal? I'm actually curious. You don't have a coach, or do you coach yourself? Yeah, coach myself. Yeah, you coach yourself. So who's going to drive you for your next goal? Are you going to look for a coach, or are you going to stick with what's working? Now I've considered. Um, I considered getting a coach, uh, and I and I said it. I, we've got a message group with the boys on the podcast. It would actually be quite entertaining to <laughs> one day read through these conversations, but. I think I said to them, I've, I've decided I'm going to get a coach to help me, um, to help guide my running. And then within probably 10 minutes, I wrote back and said, no, no, I'm, I know my body better than anyone. I, I don't think I could listen to someone. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love the fact that I can wake up and every morning I can assess how I feel and change the day's running based on how I'm feeling, whether I've recovered from the previous day's running 
um, whether I the weather is terrible, whether uh, I've got a lot of work on that day. I can be as flexible as possible and and I not have to bother someone else or or not have to be totally in contact with someone else. And and what I feel, um, I I've, I do a bit of, a little bit of coaching uh, and. I've got a, I've developed a bit of my own philosophy on 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 training over the probably the last sort of ten years of being in the sport. So I, I like where I'm at with my my training. It probably doesn't work for everyone, obviously, but in my mind, like I know what I need, and and I love being able to um to fine tune myself. That could sound weird. <laughs> Doesn't sound weird at all. Um, you're, you're very fortunate to be in the position where you are that self-aware. I think if I tried to coach myself, it would not go well. Uh, <laughs> now, Julian, obviously looking at potential new goals and things like that, is marathon the only distance where you have goals or can we see perhaps in the future the, the Parkrun Australia course record, um, the national record might might go down to Julian Spence? Is, who has that record? Liam Adams holds our men's oh, national yeah. record. Heard of him? Yes. <laughs> he, <laughs> so he last year at Berlin, he was um, he was in the race and he came back to it. We had a big Australian party afterwards and uh, he was one of the best on ground at that party. So, but I would never – no, I, I can't compete over those shorter distances. It's quite um, – it, I'm – the longer it gets, the the better I get. So, I if anything, I would be going longer in order to um, become more of a, a competitor. Uh, the short the shorter distance events that they, they help with my longer running, but I was like I'm miles off being anywhere near a competitive runner over the five thousand meters. I've never I've never qualified or never. Um, been selected to run at Zatapec 10,000 meters where they pick like 25 runners. Um, I've never been selected for that, but and I've never run a half marathon that um, rates anywhere near the sort of top 20 or 30 for the year. So the the marathon for me is is my distance at the moment. Um, otherwise, I, I I mean I have aspirations to run maybe ultra marathons when I get a little past or over the road running i i love the the idea of um, being on a trail all day and you know i've done a few ultra marathons but now I, I feel like that's where i would perform even better as you get slower i can get slower and go longer maybe that's the best way to put it and so this would explain why you haven't done a park run officially done a park run since uh, 2013 <laughs> i think it is but you, you tell me that you you incorporate Ballarat Park Run into some of your Saturday sessions without scanning in. Yeah, um, that surprises me. It's been that long since I've officially scanned in. Uh, over the we we certainly the Ballarat group, um, my training group, friends. We normally go to the the. Have you guys done Ballarat Park Run? Not yet. I have. I've done it a few times. Yeah, you have. Yeah, okay, so Vic Park, the park down there, great place to do your tempo workouts, intervals, that kind of thing. So we meet down there on a Saturday morning a lot of the time and it just normally clashes with – well, it doesn't clash with park run. We just um, – we, we, we park at the same spot where, where park run starts the race and, and a lot of the time we, we go, oh, well, let's just jump, let's just jump in. Um, and do some of our reps during the race and it's fun because we get to like I, I know probably 99 percent of the runners that are there at park run each each saturday morning um so i get to talk to those guys and and you get to to be involved in the race atmosphere which is always fun it's i mean you guys know it's it's changing the way that we know running park run and the running industry that's for sure um and so, yeah, I, we just don't bring our barcodes. Uh, I think if I had them printed in the car, then it would be a lot easier, but <laughs> we just leave it too late. And sometimes it doesn't work out where if we have like a 15-kilometre workout or a 10-kilometre workout, and you don't want to um, 
you don't want to disrupt things. Like if we have to keep running during the, the race, you don't want to have to, to confuse everyone at the finish and you don't you don't want to get in people's way. So we normally maybe pull out around the four – oh, we've done it a couple of times anyway, pull out around the, the maybe the, the 4.8K mark and just drift off to the side so we don't um, create a hassle at the finish. I want to bring it back to the podcast, Julian. Um, we've mentioned it already, Inside Running – is the podcast. It's the preeminent running podcast in Australia now. Um, I think you, you guys have done a... Oh, oh, yeah, thank you. I think you guys have done a great service to the running community in Australia that's desperate for it. Um, we, Mel and I often say that we're, we're a parkrun podcast. We like to have chats with, with runners from time to time, but we, we understand that there's a real hardcore running community and you guys have really tapped into that. Um, how have you enjoyed it? You've, you've become a bit of a character on the show with... Um, Moose on the Loose, and likewise, have you enjoyed the experience over the past couple of years doing a podcast with two mates talking running? Yeah, well, I think you just nailed it. That's exactly what it is. So we we treat it like, and and whether this is a good thing or a bad thing or a dangerous thing, we treat it like it's our Sunday long run and what we would discuss if we were just rolling along out in the bush and off like a lot of people are interested in those conversations. They want to be part of that conversation. And there was really no discussion point. Like there were a few websites around where Australian running would get discussed. There was a few forums that seemed to, um, that kind of faded away on the internet where we would discuss running or where some people would discuss running. And Facebook's a little bit like the, the, the forums on Facebook turn turn nasty and they can um they can be a bit of a bit of a rabbit hole to- chatting on facebook about this stuff and so brady it, this is like uh, we have to pay credit to brady because he had tell me your tales and tell me your tales in the beginning it seemed to focus on telling the runners of australia's uh, the runners of australia their stories and it was fantastic i loved it I would I would listen to people talk about how where they grew up, how they got into running, what their training is, their different thoughts on different races, their experiences throughout the Australia running, and and you would you it would just cover you. You got to know people, and then it turned into a little bit more running focus with the the road to Berlin, where we discussed our training leading into to Berlin, and we started to pick up a few more fans around the world, and. I kept thinking, I kept even telling other people, I'm like, I'm a little embarrassed this is getting big because all it is is us talking about our training and really who wants to listen to that? It seems quite self-obsessed to just come on a, on a, and record you talking about your training. But people have enjoyed it and they've really they've reached out to us. They say they take a lot from it, a lot of learning. We learn from each other, uh, especially with the guests that we have on now. And 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 Brady, he he's a real thinker. He's a very creative guy, and he is constantly working out ways to engage the running community and how what can we offer to the running community that's not there at the moment. And so when he came up with, um, oh well, we we decided on the name Inside Running, and it, his plan for it was exactly what it is right now. Like he he we we sort of spitballed a few ideas for different segments we wanted. Um, initially, I was very focused. Oh, well, I, I really enjoyed the guest component. I thought that was what would make the podcast because when I go out and listen to podcasts, I kind of cherry pick based on the guests that are appearing and listen to their interviews. And I thought in order to make it um, legit and people would listen to it, you would need – high caliber guests or guests with great stories and we certainly have found that i mean one of the benefits of being in the like i'm in the running industry in the work in the industry as well as run at different races so i kind of link up with a few people get good contacts we can get good interviews but what what surprised me a lot is is people reaching out to us and saying oh i just love the section where you talk about your training again and so it it comes back to us just discussing what we do on a monday where we run how our foot was feeling the shoes we ran in um the group that we were in what did we talk about it's like 
this stuff is and 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 if I listen to a podcast, they're the kind of things that I really want to know. I, I listen to a lot of interviews where I think that the interviewer he doesn't ask the nitty gritty running stuff that we're interested in. Um, talks <laughs> and 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 they're the ones that I really like. So uh, yeah, the, the podcast is is a brilliant. I mean, I, I sometimes it gets a bit much, you know, like it's on a Monday night and, and we all work and we all train and we all have partners and, and Brad, he had a, like a, a little girl yesterday with his partner or his wife, Viv. So we're, we're all quite busy and sometimes on a Monday night and it reflects in some of the podcasts, we, we, we might not prepare as well as we should and, and we might feel like a little bit uh, like we can't be bothered um, and sometimes it comes off a little sloppy like that because maybe we haven't put as much effort in, into the week. Uh, but we we probably should stick to what we know best, which is just purely talking about running and not getting into the um, not getting into the the real controversial stuff, which has got me into a trouble a few times. And, and even a couple of weeks ago I was offended someone on the show and I thought, you know, I didn't get into this. I didn't start talking on this podcast to offend people. I don't want to upset people. And so it's been a real learning experience for us to have a recorder on us for like 90 minutes every week because you you learn you learn about what can upset people. And 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 I, I felt good. Like after that, after I felt bad about upsetting someone, I thought, huh. Oh. Like maybe I'm <laughs> maybe I'm actually an all right guy if I'm feeling bad because I offended someone. Um so it's been a it's been a whirlwind actually the podcast it's been just something so different and I wouldn't be able to do it if it was a camera it's 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 easy to sit behind this computer here and just chat away running but it feels like there's no pressure and you know at the very end of the day Brady can go back and cut all the the stuff I say that's probably not appropriate he can cut all that out like I hope you will if I say something bad yeah, well, well so far so good we're not going to cut anything out um, but we can completely relate to that and I think. The idea of the guests, so we, we do it here too. We know that people cherry pick and, and we know we had uh, Rob DeCostello a couple of weeks ago and our numbers went through the roof. But I reckon you guys will mm-hmm. find your latest episode where you just recapped Berlin, your numbers will be really good there because people have really invested in your, your journey so far and they'll want to hear that. So it's a, it's a real fine balance. We can uh, definitely relate. Yeah, and um, I, I get embarrassed when we run with the boys back here because – they are. They all make fun of the podcast, and it's just a bit of banter on the run. But you're running like the, your your profile grows a little bit, and all of a sudden, like people uh, are interested in what you're doing. And sometimes, and I run with some some runners that are a lot better than I am, and it feels a little embarrassing sometimes to to um <laughs> to run along knowing that you've got this podcast going and people know who you are, and then you're running next to someone who's been in the Olympics and and maybe won't be as well recognised. It's just a little bit. Um, it, 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 you got to be, yeah. You got to take it with a grain of salt. Like we're good at talking about running, but there's a lot of great runners out there uh, that maybe we're helping to give the, the a, a platform to. It's the running, the running community in Australia is underappreciated. Like. We always use the um, the example like the 500. We probably know who the 500 best AFL player is in Australia. People would kids would wear that guy's jersey around. He would make maybe 200 to, to 300 thousand dollars. He could get into he could walk into a nightclub and, and the whole place knows who he is. Right, that, that's that's the 500 best player in the country. Whereas Michael Shelley, let's just use Michael Shelley. He won the Commonwealth Games. He, I don't. He, I don't think he has a contract where he earns a single dollar from a company. Um, he's almost unrecognisable to anyone outside the real hardcore running community. He's won two Commonwealth Games gold medals and a silver medal in the marathon. Um, and he, let's just say, he's our best marathoner at the moment. And he he doesn't make really any money from this sport. And it, it's. Hopefully, like we can help build profiles that might get get some exposure for for these runners, and and they can actually start to make a make a living out of it. Obviously, you don't do it for the glory or the uh, <laughs> the fame of being a runner. Are there plans in your future, Julian, that involve uh, the five 
rainbow rings? Uh, it's not – well, we, look, we all dream. I don't think anyone's not dreamt about running in the Olympics or, or playing their sport in the Olympics. But I'm a pretty real type of character. So I know – the limits to getting to the Olympics and I know the talent of runner around me. So where I sit at the moment, like it's a little bit of a false fact, like the fact that I'm the fastest marathoner in 2018, right? The Olympic qualifying period hasn't opened yet. So the times that are run at the moment, they don't count towards Olympic qualifying. Uh, there is a world championships next year in Doha and that's not the most attractive place to go and run a marathon. And so the level of runner that I am, I have to kind of be a little bit sly and sneaky to get myself onto teams. If I want to get on a team, I base I have to pick the, the years where it's not going to be ideal to, to to be on the marathon team. So when Tokyo qualifying comes around, you'll find that all the best runners go out and run amazing times. And my 216.39, that year might be a tenth, the tenth fastest time. Whereas this year, because there's not a lot going on, the Commonwealth Games was on and it was a slow, like a hot crap. Obviously, we all saw what happened there. It wasn't a place to run fast and – um, it, the qualifying period for Tokyo hasn't opened yet. So it, it, it's fallen in my favour that this run is, looks good on paper, but it certainly won't get me anywhere near the Olympics. I think if you're going to get to the Olympics in Tokyo, you'll need to run around 212 as an Australian. Well, I think you're focusing too much on detail there, Julian. Just live in the moment, live in the glory yeah. uh, for a few <laughs> more months anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, before before yeah. we let you go this week, I just want to go back to Berlin and the carry-on with the world record because it's a remarkable achievement. Everyone in the running world is talking about it. Uh, and you were there. You experienced it. You know, you rubbed shoulders with Kip Chogi. Can you just mm-hmm. – um, can you pinch yourself and sort of relive that moment? What was it like to be there as it happened? Yeah, well, it's interesting because – I was focused more on the ladies. So because I was going to be running around bouts the the ladies pack and, and um, Tiranesh Dibaba, she had mentioned that she wanted to break the world record. And it you just don't you don't know exactly what their the plans are. Like it seems like everyone's super confident when they come into these meets and they always want to break the world record. Um so I was more focused on, well, if she's going to break the world record, she needs to run at a certain pace and I might be able to, to, to sit with that pace and it would probably be a little fast for me, but who knows? Let's see what happens. And so after the gents went off, we, like, re- really, you saw the, the splits they run. You don't even know. You can't see them after 30 seconds. They're just gone. And so you don't really – I I wasn't really considering what was happening along the course um, up ahead anyway, but I was more focused on the ladies, whether they would break the world record, and it was clear very early on that it wasn't going to happen. So when I crossed the finish line, uh, I I said to one volunteer who was just standing around quite unimpressed with it all, I said, oh, is the world record get broken? And she said, oh, no, no. I thought, oh, okay, damn, pretty good day for it. I wonder what happened. And then the next volunteer said, no, 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 world record, yes, 201. And uh, <laughs> then I spoke to Brady afterwards and Brady said that he saw someone hold up a sign about two kilometres from the finish and the sign said Kip Chogi just ran 201, whatever it was, 30. And so he he's a bit of more of a frother athletics fan than I am and so he got – he, he said it gave him a real lift and he was talking to the guy next to him about it. It was real um, buzz for him. And then afterwards, uh, I was sitting in the ladies' tent because not many ladies had finished. There's an elite tent at the end and men's was filled with like every pacer from the race and all the finishes and it was quite smelly and gross. So I walked into the ladies' tent and sat down and they, off, they ushered um, 
Ali had in, like they wanted to get him away from all the attention. And so he came in and he was just smiling and I said, oh, well done, mate, like great great work. And he smiled back and said, oh, thank you. And then um, the guy next to me shook his hand and he was he was just a, like genuinely over the moon. And you could see at the end the emotion. Like you just don't see that from – from those guys very often and it, that was that was a real buzz but you don't like for us we didn't we were, we were a little bit away from it all happening so 15 minutes back all the celebrations are, are done but I watched it the next day the race with Bree and we were more excited watching the race <laughs> the next day because uh, we could see it all unfold but on the day I didn't really see much of it. Well, world record falling or not, I'm sure it will be a memorable marathon for you. Anyway, Julian, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast this week. It's been lovely having your insight into what it's like to be a bit of an elite running around really fast in European countries. Um, Good luck for your future endeavours and um, we'll keep listening to the podcast. Say hi to Brady for us. I will do. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, Scott. And... um I should mention, yes, I listened to your interview with Deke as well, and it was quite good. It really opened my eyes up to the Indigenous Marathon Project, more than I knew before. So well done that on that. We are at the finish line at Railton Park Run in Tasmania, and I'm with Ben Jeff. Oh, Ben. Joe Zephiak. You knew I was always, like, always going to stuff <laughs> that up, wasn't struggles. I? <laughs> ben has just uh, entered the Half Cow Club. Ben, congratulations, man. Thank you very much. It's, so, um, it's a pleasure. <laughs> so do you have a home park run? Um, well, I've kind of done a few volunteer spots at, at one particular park run in Wrexham called Erthig Park Run. That's in Wales. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that was pretty much our home for, for a long time when we were in the UK. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but other than that, no, no, 50 in 50 different places. So it's kind of, you know, merging two of my passions, running and travel. So, yeah, it's, it's been great. Awesome, mate. And so you're based here in Tassie now? Yeah, yeah we're in Launceston. Yeah. Um, been there for about four months. Yeah. And um, you moved down from Sydney. Okay. And when we got back from the UK, yeah. Ah, terrific. And uh, so Railton's a, a trail park run. And I know, are they trail shoes? Yes, yes, they are. There's a first um, outing today, actually. Yeah. And um, I think they're a bit too small. <laughs> yeah, I've got a bit of a blister forming, I think. Ah, well, that's a good way to, to trial out the new shoes yeah um athletes foot pretty good apparently okay <laughs> <laughs> um so what did you think about the rail and course here today it was it was great yeah it's good to do something a, a bit more trail um you know i was just speaking to the guys here before i've done a few park runs where you know you're just kind of running around a, a pavement kind of you know park that's really some laps so it's good to get out there and do some kind of you know um underfoot's a bit you know sketchy at times and yeah it's great running through puddles and getting a bit dirty any highlights Ben? oh yeah there's been a couple i mean um we did a fair few park runs in wales but i'd have to say like we went to poland for a holiday and um we ran one park run in Cheshire, which went into two countries so it's the only park run i think don't get me wrong <laughs> yeah. that's in two countries it goes over the border into czech republic and then um, there was one in Northern Ireland as well, which was run entirely on the beach. Wow. And that was incredible and very hard because you ran two and a half k's down the beach, turned around, and then there was just this strong wind right <laughs> in your face on the, all the way back, and that was a nightmare. Wow. But yeah, yeah, it's definitely been, there's been some amazing highlights, and yeah, it's just, parkrun's incredible. Well, thanks for talking to the parkrun adventurers. Well done today. No worries. Thank Congratulations you. Congratulations on the half cow. Oh, thanks very Good much. luck on the full cow. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's next, I guess. Good on you, mate. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Ben. Mate. No worries. We're still at the finish line. I'm here now with Catherine, the ED of Railton Park Run and the RD for today. Catherine, hello. Hello. <laughs> um, I come through in 2016 and Railton Park Run wasn't here. And I know that Toc's been here and he gives it rave reviews and I can see what he's talking about now. How's it all been going since Toc was down here? Toc turned up to our first event, our, uh, which was the 250th Australian Park Run to launch, and uh, he he actually did a Park Run Plus that day because he wasn't listening to directions uh, <laughs> when we were doing the briefing. So that was that was our first joke of our Park Run. Uh, we've had lots of stories since then, um, and we've had quite a really good core group of regular uh, runners as well as lots of visitors coming through. So um, I don't know if uh, Toc told the story at the time, but uh, our mayor really was a little bit uh, of a, a non-believer. He didn't think that a park run would bring visitors to town, but it certainly proved um, to be the case that we've had people like yourself from interstate, but we've had people from all over the world. It's been fantastic. 
Just watching John come in. He's well one done, of our, our volunteers, but he's running today. Well, well done, done, Johnny. John. Good nice job, sir. mate. And I can see why Toc uh, loves the course. It's a beautiful trail run out into the well, Tasman Trail, you said it was called? Tasmanian Trail for the first uh, one and a half kilometres and the last one and a half kilometres. And then we have a couple of loops in what we call Sykes Reserve or Sykes Sanctuary, yeah. which was donated to the community by a, a gentleman who, uh, who owned it and, and lived there as a bit of a hermit many years ago. Okay. So my wife and I were off the boat this morning and straight down here to Railton. So it's good for the adventurers to get straight off the boat and straight into some adventure. Yes. Um, and we, we had a tour of the, the topiary, the, um, all the bushes and shrubs that are shaped into different things around town. Like yep. there's some elephants and yes. cows and all different things. And I've decided we have to get a park run topiary. I think who who do I have to speak idea. to about that? Well, the, uh, if you perhaps go down to the little community information centre, I'm not sure if there's anyone in there today but we do have a community information centre and that would be the place to make that suggestion. Um, I'm sure they'd love to hear from you, but we do have a topiary group that's actively involved in, in making the frames as well. So, um, in fact, one of them ran today, but he's already left, so... Oh, we're, oh no, he's the, we've got to talk to him. We, we may catch him at breakfast at the cafe, but uh, he usually goes back to work pretty quickly. He's the local mechanic. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, we don't want to upset him and Kaz, we've got a flat battery when we get oh, back to it. Right, yes. <laughs> Kath, thanks for um, getting this going. It's a beautiful park run and your awesome team of volunteers. Plenty of high fives out there and rugby's on the course this morning. So uh, all the best with your upcoming birthday and Thank ongoing you. success with park run. Thanks very much for visiting. Thanks, Kath. Thanks to Gary, my propeller hat twin, for your roving report from Railton Park Run. Railton was the 250th Park Run event in Australia, so it's a bit special. Um, but it also sounds like it's very special for things such as topiary. Didn't know anything about that before, Scotty, did you? Mm, yes, I did know that Ralton was the, to what is it, topiary, whatever. Topiary? Topiary capital of Australia. I did know that. And good, oh, good, okay. good work to the team there. It looked like it was, or it sounded like it was windy and miserable and raining, but they soldiered on. Well done. I'm, um... I will divulge, Scotty, one of my adventures planned for this year is to go back to Tassie. I'm very excited. Mm. Are you going to go to Railton? Um, I'm not ruling it out. It's not going to be my parkrun day parkrun of choice. However, that doesn't mean there won't be a freedom run. It looks beautiful from the little video clip I've seen of it. It does, yep. But you know what's happening this weekend, Scotty? We're launching more new events. We are, after having a couple of weeks with zero launches. We're yeah. coming back strong. We saved them all up for one weekend. We got four in one weekend. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. Crazy and great all at the same time. Yeah, and one of them is in Tassie, but we'll get to that because it starts with M and we always do it in alphabetical order. So first off is Braidwood Showground in New South Wales. Ah, you know, I didn't realise we do this in alphabetical order, but that's great now that I know that. I just always assumed it was the oldest event first. No, no. Hmm. Oh, there you go. Learn something new every day. Braidwood Showground in New South Wales. And that is going to be joined by a fellow New South Walesian event at Cow Pasture Reserve Camden. The event launching in Tasmania is Montrose Foreshore. And then we've got a new one for South Australia at Stebbin Heath. Stebbin Heath. Now, before we get to the anniversaries, Mel, I have a question. I have a question okay. for Parkrun Australia. I've noticed. Like, okay. <laughs> I've noticed. So I want you to put your official uh, operations hat on here. I've noticed lately that uh, the names of our events are starting to look a bit different. They're, they're like Cow Pasture Reserve Camden. Now, in the past, that would be called Camden Park Run. Why are we calling it Cow Pasture Reserve? And the same, I'm guessing, for Braidwood Showground, maybe? I'm not sure. Tell me, tell me the reason why. We've got some different looking event names. Okay. To get a little bit official on on the listeners. Um, it's a good question. However, the um, there has been a global policy, a global naming policy uh, put in place in recent months, which obviously has impacted everywhere in the world, um, about how we name our events. And basically, the policy is... Um, 
the culmination of years and years and years of experience and learnings from the UK um, and it's keeping scalability in mind. Um, so, for example, something like Cow Pasture Reserve in Camden previously would have been known as Camden, which is the name of the town. However, that doesn't really allow for the potential in future for an additional event to be in Camden. So if you name the first one Camden Park Run and then they get another event, well, you know, do you call that Camden Park Run 2 or, you know, it gets, it just gets a bit awkward. So, um, and that also doesn't factor in that there might be another township or another place in the world called Camden, which may already have a park run. So we've got the legacy of those sorts of events elsewhere in the world. Um, and in Australia, you know, Albert Melbourne Park Run is called Albert Melbourne because there was already an Albert Park Run somewhere else. And we've got Ipswich, Queensland for the same reason, because in the UK there's already an event called Ipswich. So it's primarily to um, uh, future-proof, I guess, is the way you would put it. And the way the names get determined now is basically we just have to identify the smallest geographical like identifiable geographical reference points. So if an event starts and finishes in a park, such as a park named Cow Pasture Reserve, for example, that's what the event's going to get called pretty much. Does Thank that answer you. your question? It does. Thank you for the clarification. I kind of already knew, Thank but you. I thought it was a good question to ask. And I, I really like it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rely on my own personal experience here. And I'm pretty sure this was explained to me when I started Westerfolds Park Run. And I've had this debate with my wife ever since day one. In fact, before Westerfold started, she wanted to call it Templestowe Park Run, which is the suburb it's located in. And I was okay. adamant. I was adamant. I was pounding the table again. That, no, we're going to call it Westerfolds because that's where it is. And it's the same with Studley because it's in Studley Park, Westerfolds Park. I really like that naming convention because if it was, it was named in the suburb, it could be anywhere. And I want people to associate I want that park to be famous. That's the one that people are going to and running in every week. So I like the idea. And you know, you know, another reason that it works is, for example, um, you also now have a junior park run event in Westerfolds. So that's Westerfolds Juniors. And they use an example in the UK with Harrogate Park Run. Um, they also have Harrogate Junior Park Run. However, the two events are in different parks. So the fact that you know, one is in one place and the other one's somewhere else. They've had people showing up for juniors on a Sunday where they have the 5K event on the Saturday, but that's not correct because correct, they actually have the event somewhere else. So if this naming policy had been in place prior to those events being named, then there wouldn't be that kind of confusion. And, and Westerfolds and Westerfolds Juniors are a perfect example of they're both in the same park, so that's accurate. Whereas you might have had another place in Templestowe where you could have had your junior park run and one of them might have been in Westerfolds Park and the other one somewhere else. So, it, um, yeah, it's just another level of helping reduce the confusion potentially for park runners. Yeah, look, it's very possible. So then the, my next question is, are we going to start changing names of existing park runs to avoid future confusion? Uh, not as far as I'm aware. The, the events that we've currently got in place, um, they'll all be retaining their same names. We have actually changed a couple of event names in the past um, when another event or a prospect has come, come up in the same sort of area and it's been realised that the original event wasn't actually named appropriately. Um, it was it just sort of referenced too broad of an area or it wasn't even quite specifically that that um, location as such. So it, it was going to cause confusion. But yeah, in terms of the events that we already have existing, no, they won't be changing unless we, we come up against a particular problem someplace. Okay. So with all that information in your brains now, let's go through the anniversaries and have a think about the names of some of these park runs. Because we are celebrating anniversaries at Ashgrove in Queensland. At Bowral in New South Wales. Marimbula and Moree, both in New South Wales as well. And we've got New Farm in Queensland. Tamworth, New South Wales. And Yu Yangs in Victoria. So thinking about all those events, there's there's potential there to like I, there's a good chance we might have another event in Tamworth. 
one day? You'd hope so. It's possible. It's I mean, it's not always just based on the size of the town either. And you do need to consider the fact that, um, you know, some towns have twin towns elsewhere. We've got a prospect in Scone at the moment, for example, but there's already a Scone park run. Well, there's already a Scone in the UK, I should say. Um, so, yeah, it's Scone here in Australia is not a large place but we certainly won't be calling the event Scone Park Run because that doesn't fit with the naming convention now. I feel all weird being official on the podcast, Scotty. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, but I've had enough of it, so let's go to the hotline. Hotline. And we've got a couple of questions as we, um, we've sneakily – added them to the bingo challenge for Streaky September. So we love it that uh, a lot of our regular listeners and those doing Streaky September are sending in the questions. Stroke of brilliance on your behalf, Scotty, to do this because what better way to get content for the podcast than make it a challenge on Streaky Bingo. We know people love ticking off checklists and and Streaky Bingo is no exception. And let's go to our first one. Scotty and Mel, what's your favourite training session and your least favourite training session? Well, Scotty, do you want to take that one first this time? I'm pretty sure you made me answer first last week. Did I? You were paying attention to that sort of stuff. Okay, (laughs) favourite and least favourite training sessions. You know what my favourite training sessions are, Mel? They're the really short ones. I actually like the ones, <laughs> I do, I like the ones with a nice nice cruisy warm-up, so you can do a warm-up for about 3 to 5k, just get nice and loose, chat to your mates, and then just some really short, sharp sprint work, so either it's, whether it's straights and bends on an athletics track, or something I did last night with my mate Rob, we just ran up and down a footy oval, so it's just 150 metre sprints, and you do about 8 of them, and then that's the session done you got a good speed workout and then you can go and have your cool down which is nice cruisy jog chat again that's my favorite type of workout my least Least favorite favorite? my least favorite i've got to admit right at the moment it's is is a long run a a workout yeah it's a training session it's part of a training program i'm gonna go with that because i've skipped my sunday long run for about three or four months in a row now I'm trying to stretch it out to six month break of skipping the long run because it's just just the idea at the moment of going for a two hour run. Not for me at the moment. Okay. Do you feel like that's because it's it's boring or you just you know you're just not feeling um, inspired? Yeah, the well, idea of it. I tell you what, Julian's got me inspired, and I think the weather, warmer weather's getting a bit more inspired to lift my running, but I think it's just the fact of running for a long period of time. Okay, fair enough. Well, my favourite training session, it's its kind of in the same vein as yours when you say the short ones. I i actually really love interval training. So, you know, you do your, your repeats, let's say six, um, you, you have a warm up for a couple of minutes and then you do one minute fast and then two minute sort of gentle and then one minute fast and then two minute gentle and you do that six times and then you have a cool down and it's um it can be over in like 20 minutes and but you still get a lot of benefit out of it because you do the the hard push for like a minute and then you can ease off so you still get the breaks in there as well um so that's my favorite so we're kind of the same yeah kind of but it's all you know what it's also my least favourite. It's the one <laughs> that, that I don't look forward to and it's the one that I find the hardest because of that, oh, my God, can I possibly have the lung capacity to run for this full minute as fast? And do you ever get the feeling like when you're sprinting you look stupid? Oh. Like I am i wouldn't say that I'm, I'm a vain runner by any means, but I don't think I'm one of those weird-looking runners who kind of has this gait where you think, wow, honey, you're just using a lot of energy there. You do not need to be flapping those arms around yeah. or doing what you're doing with those legs. But I think when I sprint, I probably just look really stupid. <laughs> well, I've got the advantage of I look stupid, sprinting, walking, jogging. I just look silly anyway. So I don't, okay. I don't tend to worry about that too much. Although last night, I, like I said, I did this session 
with my mate Rob, and he's faster than me. And I, I noticed on a couple of run throughs, like he was, he started behind me, and I know he was shouting, "Lift your cadence, check your form," because I'm a mess. <laughs> and he felt the okay. need to correct me. Um, yep. So yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, you. I do get a bit conscious. You've got to look. You like you're supposed to be doing the right things when you're doing these sessions. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good question, Simon. Thanks for that. Great question. And we've got another one. Oh, we just heard from Gary. Should we hear from him again? Yeah, let's hear from him again because he's got a friend with him. Well, technically time. this question isn't from Gary. He is just True. the person who is in charge of the technology for his mate, Flynn. G'day, Mel and Scott, park runners, adventurers, everybody that's listening to the pod. I hope you're having a happy streak month. And it's Gary Murphy reporting in live from the... Sunbury Park Run finish line, an 1880s historic bluestone bridge. And I've, I've found a special guest here who's got a, a question for Mel and Scott. Okay, so translated, that is Mel and Scott, where is the strangest, weirdest, or most interesting place that you've had a, ever had a, a walk or run? Happy streaking, everybody. See you at Palm 19. I'll, I'll jump in and take this one first, Scotty. Um, because it's it's a bit of an odd question, weirdest and strangest place. Um, I guess it really depends on what you classify as weird. And if you're a bit of an oddball person in general, I reckon the scale of weirdness is probably a little bit skewed to what somebody who is perhaps a little bit more conservative, mainstream, has. Um, but anyway, for me, I think... I'm going to take it to my marathon, my one and only marathon yet since, you know, we've been talking about marathons this episode. And it, there was a moment, oh, there were lots of moments in that marathon that were bizarre, you know, uh, running in a fancy dress marathon across 42.2 kilometres of um, rolling hills with vineyards and having wine stations every two kilometres and then, you know, oysters and um all sorts of degustation things offered in the last 10K. There, there are lots of moments there that you would not experience in any other marathon. But because it was also fancy dress and they go all out, um, the participants in this particular marathon, Marathon Dumadoc, and the year I did it was a sci-fi theme and there were literally people running with like life-sized alien spaceships so they were all dressed as aliens and they had these things on wheels and they had little um things sticking out the sides um what what do you call handles i guess so that at any given time they could have six different runners pushing the alien spaceship and i've had people yelling at me in french to please get out of the way We, we want to overtake you with our spaceship um So the marathon offered a lot of opportunities for some (laughs) weird, never-to-be-repeated moments. But possibly the one that eclipses all of them, what happened, I think it it was fairly early into the event, maybe in the first 10K even, and running along this path that you've got to both sides of you just acres and acres of um, vines, of grapevines. And to the, uh, to the right of us, and I kid you not, there were about 10 people lined up at the end of the grapevines, um, relieving themselves because I guess, you know, 8,000 participants, there weren't enough port at previous stations. And when you got to go, you got to go. But <laughs> they're all dressed as Superman or um, an alien or just the, the most random sci-fi costumes. And they're all lined up at the end of these things individually. That, that I think was the strangest and weirdest, well, I'll say place, but it was kind of experience in my running career thus far. Okay, I'll, I'll pay that. This this event, you've, you've talked about it before, it it's just sounds like one big party. It doesn't really sound like oh, a, big time. Yeah, a marathon as such. Yeah, one day I might do a serious marathon, but I've got to go back and do this not so serious one first so I can undo my DNF, my official DNF, even though I did the distance. I've got so what one. about you, Scotty? Yeah, my weirdest one. So I went out for a run. This was a couple of years ago. I went uh, near where I live in Warrandyte. There's a state forest and lots of little single single track trail running. This was back in the days when I enjoyed that stuff and could stay <laughs> upright. 
And I was just running along, and I was running along uh, a fire track, and I noticed in the bush that someone had, there was a little path. There was another little single track going into the bush. So, so I thought, okay, okay, I'll go and explore that because I'd never run in this area before. Anyway, you're fighting your way through some trees, but I was determined to see where the track goes. And at the end of it just appears this altar, this like something out of the movies, old, neglected altar with some pews. Like, like a big table slab no, was, sort of altar? Yeah, it was, just, it was just a concrete slab with some church stuff and then there was – Concrete pews, is that what they call like chairs? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sort of aligned so you could sit down and and watch whoever does their thing up on this stage altar, and like it was really weird. Like in the middle, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere, there was just this thing, and and I dusted off some dirt and some leaves and rocks and stuff, and I think it was it's it's somehow linked to the scouts because there was some scout symbols in there, but. It's in the Warrandyte State Forest area, Jumping Creek. If you're in Melbourne and you want to check it out, go down to Jumping. State forests are always just a bit creepy, aren't they? Yeah, it was very, very creepy. And I've been back there and I've taken a few people back there without warning them. And everybody who comes with me is just like, this is this is weird. This is... They feel like they're going to be sacrificed. Where yeah. have you taken us, Scotty? Yeah. <laughs> This is some Aslan, Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe kind of bollocks. Very much so. It's, and it's in a nice, a really nice part of Melbourne. You're just not expecting it. and But it's in a part of Melbourne where you kind of would expect some, some maybe some sacrifices or something like that going on, some weird cult behaviour. You know, I think you've probably just found the next hot spot that everyone's going to want to go check out. Yeah, yeah, you'll, well, you'll be getting a lot of messages. Where is this place? I want to go see it. Yeah, I'm happy to take people for a run. Anytime you want to come for a run, I'll, I'll gladly revisit this spot. But that was definitely a weird moment. And and to find it by myself, yeah. And, and can I just tell you another time? Another time, very, very similar location. This was back in the days when I didn't have any mates to run with and I'd go out and explore these trails by myself. And I went down to the local, our local dam. And this was, again, a few years ago. And, and as you go, there's a walking track all the way around it. But as you start the walking track, there's all these warning signs. You need to check in with the local ranger, allow, you know, 10 hours or whatever to do the, the 10K or 14K circuit. I ignored all oh. those signs and just as you kept, do. Yeah, just kept <laughs> running. And I'd left it late in the Sunday afternoon. And I'd started running and I'd got to about 7 or 8k in and everything was fine. I'd found some great trails. I was by myself, absolutely nobody around. I'd seen some wild deer, heaps of kangaroo everywhere. But then it got to this point where the sort of the track ran out. And so obviously some trees had fallen down and nobody had sort of walked through this track for a long period of time. And I was 7k in. It was getting dark. I didn't have my phone. And then all of a sudden, like, more wild deer started making noises in the bush. And (laughs) I started freaking out. And I was also probably less fit than I am now because it was in the early days. And I'm thinking, shit, I've run 7K. I'm stuck. I've actually got to run 7K back out, back up and over a massive hill. I started In the dark, more than likely. It was getting dark. I panicked. Anyway, what I did is I bush bashed. And sort Looking of tried for the to, trail on the other side. Yeah, and estimated, and I've sort of followed the river's water's edge and eventually refound the, the track. But it was, again, it was one of those creepy, I'm in the middle of nowhere, no one's around. If I disappeared, if I was eaten by a wild deer, if that's Nobody what, would wild, find you. Nobody would find me, no. I'd be one of those news item stories. Local man yeah. went for a run, never to be heard of again. Yep. I had one of those experiences on a on a ski piste in France. <laughs> and I was like, this is how those stories start with a dumb tourists, you know. Um, they go missing and then they get found later completely frozen to death. That yeah. was me. Yeah, and the news story would be happening in front of the sign that says, check in with your local ranger, do not enter without a permit. Yeah. <laughs> Warnings <laughs> ignored. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny now because now they've they've removed all those limitations. Anyone can walk around this. Damn, we've done it as a running group plenty of times. The the track is completely clear now. Yeah, I'm here to tell the tale. I didn't get lost. Uh, you're lucky. It could have gone badly for you, Scotty. Great I'm questions. 
Thanks, guys. We're loving the hotline. Yeah, lots of different stuff coming from different minds. That's that's what we love, the power of brains that are not our own. Now, let's, let's address a couple of other issues that have come up during the week. The poll. You've been asking a poll on Facebook, or we've been asking. Yes, we did pop that up, as promised, probably a little bit later than people were expecting. We were going to do it on the day we released the podcast, and then we promptly forgot about it because we're always making promises that we don't keep in our podcasts. Um, But we did remember it before the week was out and uh, posted it earlier this week. Some interesting results there, Scotty. It's the poll itself, and this isn't something that we set. I think it's a Facebook thing, but it, it, it runs for seven days. So I don't know. Do we want to wait until those seven days are up and give the results yep. next week? Do yep. we want to give some prelim results? Or? No, we'll do it next week because it will be a nice lead into our Pearlustration because we're going to be asking you a lot more questions and we'll talk a bit more about that on next week's pod. So yes, let's wait. it's almost Pearlustration time of yes, year. We this, love this time of year. This is a preview to the Pearlustration. So that's coming back in October. We're giving away another prize, Mel. Ooh, we gave away a watch last year, Scotty. How, yep. how much better could it be than that? It's exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's still pretty cool. It's pretty cool. A GPS we're, watch. We're giving away another watch, yeah. Maybe you could win it, Mel, and actually wear a watch when you run. Well, oh, no, see, no, it's okay. It I've already got be, one for you. That's okay. It would have to be sunk to my Strava and mm. all my things. And you know what? I still – I was thinking about this the other day. I've been doing Run Down Under all year, or at least I've been logging my um, – all my activities, yet nothing uh, – as far as Run Down Under is concerned, I'm still in Canberra. So I really need to sort out why my Strava says that this week I've done zero kilometres, even though I've done X amount of activities with this many kilometres in them. Some some things are right. If, if there are any – Strava tech wizards out there, please reach out and let me know because I'm at a loss and Adam's even had a look at it. I think you had a look at it at one point, Scotty. Can't sort my Strava out. So help would be much appreciated. Good. And one thing we we, we touched on last week was I, I quickly mentioned the Daryl, the Daryl, <laughs> the double the barrel. The Daryl <laughs> <laughs> the Daryl Barrel Club, that sounds all right. But no, the Double Barrel Club. So this was suggested to me on a freedom run around Centennial Park a couple of weeks ago. And okay, so it's a new club for well, creation. It, it's been suggested as a new club, but I'm, you know, Mel, I'm not really up to it with the unofficial clubs. I like the ones that I'm interested in, but there are so many there that I can't keep track of them all. But this one was, so the Double Barrel Club would be like Woi Woi. Ah, where it's that woi woi curl curl, where they yeah. have a name repeated. Exactly. So you've got to do the curl curl, you've got to do woi woi. Uh, there is a campaign to change wogga to wogga wogga. To wogga wogga. To be included in the club. Okay. A double. So it's it's based on the name. Yep. Mullen Mullen. Okay. We've got a place on the Sunshine Coast called Bly Bly. We should, we should get an event going in Bly Bly so we can have a double barrel club entrance. So I think, without doing any research, off the top of my head, it, it currently stands as Mullum Mullum, Woi Woi, Curl Curl. Do those in three. In Australia. Do those three in Australia and you're in the double barrel club. Now, I'm sure there are more overseas, but let's make it achievable for now. <laughs> okay. So there's a double barrel club. Interesting. And it, it crosses states, so that's um you gotta be you gotta be a bit adventurous to get there. But it's not yeah, it's not by any means out of the question. Yep. Very doable. Very, hmm. very doable. So we'll throw that out. And who there. suggested this to you at your freedom run then, Scotty? So we've got to credit that one to Glenn Moore from Curl Curl Park Run. So he's obviously awesome. got a vested interest because he's already done Curl Curl. <laughs> he's got he's got the home park run advantage. <laughs> yeah, but I like it. Very and cool. You had another idea because you've got concerns about my last minute streak challenge. Yeah, just a little bit. It's it's been raised in the um in the group that um you know streaking after eleven p.m. might pose um, some difficulties for people who don't feel safe running at that time of night. Um, you know what? It, it actually poses difficulties as well probably for parents of small children who um, can't necessarily get out at night. So I thought we should be a little bit 
not lenient, but creative. And obviously we don't want to put anyone at risk or we don't want anyone to feel like they have to put themselves at risk um, if they don't feel some to be heading out. But it is a challenge, you know. People need to step up for a challenge. And like we have with the uh, running with a the pooch, there's a little bit of an asterisk and people can instead choose to run with a person um, with a, a popular dog name, kind of name. Um, so we thought, how could we still make this a challenge without detracting too much from the last minutedness of it, um, which I'm still yet to do, by the way, Scotty. I don't know how you're going on bingo, but I'm still yet to figure out how I'm going to approach this one. I think I might go the asterisk version for this myself. The idea is Cinderella had to be home by midnight. Otherwise, everything that her uh, fairy godmother had done would be undone and go back to normal and she would be exposed. So what we're thinking is you have to run with a pumpkin because you can't do the by midnight thing. So effectively... Uh, your coach is no longer a coach. It's a pumpkin. That's the challenge, people. What do you think, Scotty? Would you prefer to do that? No, I'm, I'm going to do the, the last minute challenge, but I do like this idea. I'd probably, I'd probably earmark it for one of your short 2K walks. Probably don't carry the pumpkin <laughs> on your 20K long run. I think that depends on the size of the pumpkin, but I like this because, you know, people can get some nice natural produce and I'm not talking about buying one of those pumpkins that's been split in half down the middle. You need a full pumpkin, people, okay? There was no half a carriage with only two wheels. You need a full pumpkin. And um, you can either do this toward the end of the month and perhaps um, keep it to carve up for Halloween if you celebrate Halloween or, you know, make yourself a good batch of pumpkin soup or roast pumpkin. Yum, yum. There's like multiple benefits to this challenge. There are. I'm not a big fan of pumpkin. Oh, I'm partial to roast pumpkin. I like pumpkin pie, but everything else, bleh. <laughs> okay, so no pumpkin soup for Scotty. No. Nope. But that's all right. So this this is the challenge. Now, we also have um, our first person, number one parkrun adventurous podcast fan, Melissa Ellis, claiming to have completed her bingo this week and is looking for level up challenges. She's creating her own level up challenges, Scotty. Did you see this? <laughs> this was remarkable. So, Melissa, if, you, if you're not in there, there's a group for Streaky September. If you're not in it, what are you doing? Get in it. So, Melissa There's posted, still time to join. Yeah, Melissa posted a video of herself doing running the gauntlet to avoid getting sued by a magpie. And I thought, I started out watching the video and I thought, oh, Melissa's just being a bit silly. Um, she's going she's to run with a helmet on and she's got that silly jumper on. Why would you wear that the in Colin, public? Collingwood. Jersey. Yeah. And then she starts running and bang. I won't I won't spoil it if you haven't seen it, but it's definitely definitely worth a watch. So well done, Melissa. You are you are definitely our number one fan. I do love her commitment to Streaky Bingo. However, Scotty, I do also feel um perhaps we need to step in here and create some level up challenges that are not gonna cause physical harm or the potential yes. for injury to people. I'm not doing that one, by the way. doesn't have any more of these wonderfully crazy ideas. Um, have yeah, you got I, any, any thoughts on some level up challenges? We I haven't think, discussed this off no, the podcast we have, yet. No, we haven't discussed this yet, Mel. So let's put it, it on the Facebook badly. page. Yep, it could end badly. So let's not start. Let's workshop okay. a couple for the end of the month. We've only got a few days. We've got a bit over a week to go. Um, I t I'm, I'm, I'm in for a challenge because my girls are out. They skipped... A day. Oh, I know. No. Yep. The streak is broken. The streak got broken. So I'm I'm on my own for the rest of the month, which uh, could could go either way. Could go either way. And how are you going with it all? You haven't. I mean, you haven't missed any yet. But have you had any close shaves? No, I haven't even had any close shaves this this month. It's been good. Well, that's awesome. I I'm loving. Once again, you know, everybody sharing in um, on Strava and Facebook the in the group and stuff where they've been streaking. And I'm loving seeing the ones where people are going that they have never, like places they've never been before, but local places that they've lived in an area for a long time. Um, Chris Fraser, I'm talking about you. It's it's just awesome. It's It's what Streaky September is about, people getting out there and doing things they haven't done before. And... 
lots of people streaking. This is the longest streak they've ever done as well, which is awesome. And, um, yeah, there's just so much joy given to us in that group and on Strava, seeing all these things happening. And some great Strava art coming in too, Scotty. I love the ones where people are um, amalgamating multiple um, activities. They're just like superimposing them all together to create words and um, other pictures and stuff. That's very creative. Yeah, I'm loving the creativity of the Strava art. I've got to be honest with you, Mel, I don't think I'm going to do – I'm not going to do the bingo challenge myself. This month. No, you're not going to get the whole card, you don't think? I don't think so, because I haven't really paid that much attention to it in completing it, and we've only got a few days left to go. Oh, there's plenty of days. There's plenty of days. We've got more than a week, and there's only eight challenges on the card. You can do it, Scotty. You can do it. I'll try. You can do it. I'll try. But on that note, Mel, we're going to say goodbye. We are. And, and shall we release a couple of level-up challenges, let's say three level-up challenges um, dedicated to on Facebook in the group yes, we like shall. in a couple of days just we to give shall. people a few more days to actually do them. Yep. So get in that group if you want to be in the know and know what we're talking about. Otherwise, just tune in uh, to next week's episode and find out what you missed out on. Or if you're listening to this in December 2019. <laughs> <laughs> you really and missed you want out. to do a slightly delayed streaky bingo, that's completely okay too. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, but thank you, Mel. Let's wrap it up. Say goodbye. All right. I'll chat to you next week, Scotty. Mm-hmm.